Giving Up the Ghost by Stuart Wallen. Chapter 1. Introduction. Huddled beneath a tightly stretched black tent canopy, they mourned a grandson, a son, a brother, a nephew, a cousin, and a friend. Jesus wept, the pastor paused with a rehearsed flair that only a hundred funerals before could have honed. As if on cue, gentle sobs and sniffles filled the dead air he'd pronounced. And it was clear to everyone just how much he'd loved Lazarus, but I think Jesus couldn't help but feel there was something he could have done to save him if only he'd been there. Wayne Vital nodded solemnly, hands crossed in what seemed to be the somberly appropriate thing to do. An apparent suicide, they'd said. Did he leave a note? Closed casket. Wayne bowed his head and pretended to continue listening to the preacher, but staring at the ill-fitting dress shoes he'd bought for the occasion, he wondered in that moment whether he could return them the following day. These fucking shoes. Wayne and Clay, the decedent, had been friends since middle school, having later roomed together during their freshman and sophomore years at a Midwestern state school just far enough away from home for a little independence, but close enough for free laundry over the weekend. By the time Wayne decided on grad school, Clay had already collected his bachelor's after only six credit-laden semesters and had gotten out of there. They hadn't talked much since. They'd drifted apart during those later undergrad years. It tends to happen when young adults begin to spread their wings and leave the nest. But they were still friends, Wayne felt. Clay had his life. Something with computers, Wayne wanted to say. Wayne, however, had committed himself to more school. Something in the social sciences, Clay had once thought. Meantime, the old pastor had been prattling on about resurrection or salvation or some other damned thing Wayne opted to never think about. When you're dead, that's it. The casket lowered, and Clay was gone. Christina, a perky blonde with cotton candy perfume and a fake Louis Vuitton bag, offered Wayne a sympathetic frown, squeezing his left hand and tipping her head toward the car. Ready? Wayne had been dating her since June, having met at a party during the summer session. Christina liked to party, as undergrads do. But she didn't know any of these people. Wayne had told her in the car, and he didn't want to make a night of this anyway. Before the funeral, though, they'd agreed to grab a drink with some of the other guys Wayne and Clay had gone to school with. Wayne would have to hear about how some of them had never left and how some had left and come back. But they all still live within an hour of this fucking place, Wayne had always chosen to notice. He, conversely, had managed to add more distance, albeit not much, from Portonville. And to him, that meant he was just a visitor now, which suited him just fine. Still, these were all decent guys from what Wayne remembered, and he could muscle through one drink, then get the hell out of there. Now isn't a good time for catching up, he told himself. Thesis deadlines were not flexible. No out-of-state license plates, Wayne remarked smugly, pulling into a spot near the back of the sports bar. How much you want to bet the wait staff will be wearing referee shirts, Wayne asked rhetorically. What a shithole. But Christina was looking forward to hearing some stories Wayne may have chosen not to tell her, and a drink really didn't sound bad to either of them before getting back on the road for a couple more hours. Wayne wanted to be home before dark. The other mourners had arrived before them and pushed several tables together. They were loosened ties, pitchers of beer, a couple of wives, some tan lines where rings had once been, and wait staff dressed like referees, and Zach Strickland's pregnant girlfriend. What was her name again? Sienna? Sierra? Signa, she announced with an outstretched hand to Christina. Wayne noticed all the ones from the funeral who had kids tagging along were no-shows here. Big surprise. Christina assimilated into the group easily enough, and Wayne excused himself to the bar for something not served by the pitcher for eight bucks. By the time he arrived at the table with the IPA for himself and a Bacardi for Christina, she was already engaged in a hushed but animated conversation with Signa. Christina snatched the rum from Wayne's hand and took an excited sip, fanning herself with her free hand. Girl stuff, Wayne guessed, opting instead to join the guys who were, no doubt, sharing stories about Clay. Just finish your beer and tell him you've got a long drive home. Kurt Horton was going on about the time Clay had hacked into their middle school's network and retrieved locker combinations for a few guys he felt were due a comeuppance. That's right, Wayne smiled nostalgically, rushing another sip from the pint glass. He'd forgotten all about that. I got that beat, Zach Strickland offered. Well, sort of. He pointed to a man in a motorized wheelchair Wayne hadn't recognized during the service. Probably a co-worker, Wayne had thought, or maybe one of these people that just shows up at strangers' funerals. Tell him what you told me, Zach encouraged the paraplegic. Hi, I'm Mike, the slight man uttered in an awkward, shy tone as he wheeled his chair closer to the others. More the spectator type, he clearly hadn't expected to be telling any stories and looked uneasy about sharing this one. I never actually met Clay in person, Mike began, delicately setting his palms on his dead legs but he helped me once, and I'll never forget it. Mike preferred to leave things at that, but Zach wouldn't hear of it. 
After Mikey here had his accident at work, our boy Clay made things, mm, how do you put it? Zack snapped his fingers, searching for the sorts of words he'd never master. He negotiated a more equitable settlement for me, Mike explained reluctantly. What do you mean? Wayne interjected. Clay wasn't a lawyer. Negotiated how? Wayne only knew the Clay he'd played D&D with, the Clay he'd roomed with, the dude with the dankest memes sharing peyote in the desert, all those miles logged together. The Clay negotiated a settlement in a disability case didn't fit the profile. I guess it doesn't matter now anyway, right? Mike mumbled, chuckling nervously. Okay, you all know how Clay was a cybersecurity consultant. Wayne nodded, but he didn't know that. Well, that was just his day job. I met Clay on the dark web. Mike waited, hoping it might click with someone, but it was no use. He was a hacker for hire, all right? I was going to be getting a shit settlement, and Clay fixed it. He fixed everything. Mike raised a shot glass from the joint tables in a quivering hand. To Clay! Fixed it? What the actual fuck? Wayne knew Clay could do just about anything with a computer, and cybersecurity consulting sounded like a lucrative racket. Why get involved with the wrong side of cybercrime? Mike had quietly excused himself from the group after consuming the shot and was motoring out the front door. Wayne finished the last of his beer in a choking gulp, unable to appreciate the citrus and floral notes he normally loved to ramble on about, and chased after Mike in these fucking shoes. Mike was ascending hydraulic ramp into his modified van when Wayne stepped to the curb in front of it. Thanks for coming, Mike, he offered with sincerity. Mike gave him a kindly nod, but said nothing as he maneuvered within the van, retracting the ramp. So you really can still buy anything on the dark web, huh? Wayne mused. I guess I always thought that stuff got taken down. Still out there, Mike huffed, struggling to pull himself from the chair and into the driver's seat as the rear door closed itself. Wayne stood at the driver's window and Mike lowered it, sensing another tedious question. So, do you know why Clay did it? Wayne asked softly. The suicide, I mean. Mike shook his head grimly. Suicide, he mumbled. No, but managing to shoot himself in the back of the head was quite a feat. Wayne's own head swelled with a pounding disbelief at the revelation. Thump. Thump. Mike reached for the shifter and checked his mirrors. What, what are you saying? Wayne stammered, trying to keep his voice low. Do you think he was killed? Mike impatiently returned the van to park and twisted himself finally toward Wayne. Clay helping me out wasn't the end of the story. While he's putting the screws to the thumbs of my former employer, Mike sighed, they brought on a cyber specialist of their own. Another someone whose services can only be commissioned in hard-to-find places. A corporation hired. What, some guy to hunt him down? Clay never needed my money, though he made a bunch once we got the settlement, Mike revealed. Clay did it because he felt it was the right thing to do for someone who got fucked over. He was a friend, not just some guy I paid to get justice for winding up in a chair. Mike stared at Wayne, blindly returning his hand to the shifter. Their guy was good. They must have found him. Mike reflected with a tentative, nervous sneer. Anyway, Mike closed, shifting to reverse. See ya. Chapter 2. Review of the Literature Wayne was hunched over a laptop, typing darknet markets into a Tor browser. His smartphone pinched between his right ear and shoulder. He kicked off the tight dress shoes the moment he'd gotten home, but still donned the pressed slacks and starched dress shirt, albeit untucked now. The tie was slung over the bedroom doorknob. He clicked on hidden marketplaces. Baby, you know I have to work on this tonight. He clutched the phone now in his hand. Christina was going out for drinks with friends, but Wayne had work to do if there would be any hope of abandoning that dreadful cancel culture proposal he'd previously planned to pitch to his advisor, Dr. Gordon. Gordon will eat this shit up, Wayne blurted to Christina. He's a folklorist. What's not to love about it? I mean, what happens if an urban legend turns out to be real? Most of these links require an invitation. Wayne squinted at the computer screen, but the choice between trusted marketplaces and all others was a no-brainer. They said they loved each other, and he hung up the phone, scrolling through links. Christina would probably be coming over after the bars. She wouldn't be in the mood to hear about a thesis statement, he figured, making a mental note to remember to shower sometime before 2 a.m. Social security cards, passports, firearms, dope. Wait, Lifetime Netflix? But none of this really came as any surprise to Wayne. This shit had always been going on. Everyone understood that there would always be a market for these things. For a moment, he dreaded the prospect of having to revert to cancel culture if he couldn't find the hidden corners where Clay had lurked. Then a thumbnail photo of a guillotine beside a giving up the ghost link in a comical bloody font demanded his attention. Click. Fucking captcha. He clicked photos featuring crosswalks before being able to proceed. You're being logged in as a guest. What he then saw appeared to be a live broadcast. Or was it a still image? No. 
Wayne saw pixelation indicating motion. There was an empty chair lit from above. It was an open space, maybe a warehouse. Wayne couldn't tell for sure. Anything beyond the reach of a single overhead lamp was shrouded in darkness, but there was an ambient hum suggesting a large facility. Yes, probably a warehouse, Wayne thought. Weekly free show was superimposed above the video with direct a scene below. A chat column was seated to the right with user privileges split between directors and guests. Reaper at UR6 was the lone user in the director's column. The moderator went by the name Mark1537. Okay, I'll play along for a minute, Wayne shrugged, rising to fetch a glass of wine from the kitchen. It was a Pinot Noir he'd opened the night before, later opting to save it for cooking, but he didn't feel like eating now. He admired the iconic filmmaker who peddled the vino, but Wayne found he didn't particularly enjoy drinking the product he was slinging. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. The guttural, digitally modified, over-modulated voice boomed from the laptop speakers. Wayne slid in his dress socks across the linoleum kitchen floor, jerking to a stop just past the doorway, spilling red wine on his crisp shirt. Fuck! He dashed to his seat in front of the laptop. A man with gray hair and a stubbly face now occupied the lighted chair. Probably a bum. He was filthy and looked like a drunk. He wasn't bound to the chair, but there was a sense he felt obligated to remain seated. A figure loomed beside him, all features obscured by practical means. Long sleeves, gloves, and a mask. With all the black coverings, it was hard to tell, but Wayne thought the figure might have been wearing a headset. Is that a microphone? Meantime, the drunkard was hiccuping and slurring requests to his host. Hate to keep asking, but you said there'd be a bottle of wine? The figure patted the bum patiently, reassuringly on the shoulder. The figure approached the camera and typed. Mark 1537. Showtime. There was a frenzy of activity now in the chat column. Anon 6. How much to direct? The figure typed. 1537. One Bitcoin and on six, but worry about that later. It's guest night. How shall we begin? Anon six. Punch him? The figure retreated from the laptop with a bottle of wine, handing it to the bum. To the unfortunate man, it was like hitting the lottery, and he wasn't waiting for a glass. He unscrewed the cap just as the figure's fist came down on his jaw, toppling him to the concrete floor in a puddle of cheap red wine. He spat blood and teeth. Wayne recoiled for a moment at the unexpected violent outburst, but something didn't smell right here. There was no way this was live. Just a well-produced video meant to perpetuate an urban myth. Wayne felt in control. What did they call these things? Christina was always listening to podcasts, usually true crime. Wayne preferred listening to music on road trips, but he didn't mind enduring a few episodes if it satisfied her macabre FOMO. On one trip to Six Flags, the subject focused on what was essentially a new twist on an old myth. Like snuff films for the internet age, Wayne remembered thinking at the time. Red Rooms, he now recalled. If I'm right, it's back to cancel culture, Wayne sighed, typing a request to the actors he was surely witnessing. If this was, or is, even a live broadcast, he clicked return. Anon 22. Anon 22. Shoe on head. LOL. The figure approached the camera, apparently reading comments. Is he smiling? The figure retreated once again to the man lying in a heap on the floor. He removed the man's left shoe, then pulled him upright. Is his jaw broken? How do you even fake that? The figure swung hard, beating the drug mercilessly on top of the head with the wooden heel of his own shoe. Blood streamed like cage bars down the bum's horrifically placated face as the figure now gently balanced the shoe on top of his brutalized head. Fuck, fuck, fuck! Wayne bolted to a standing position, covering an agape mouth with a trembling hand. The figure approached the camera again, reading, Reaper at UR6, is happy hour over yet? Finish this piece of trash and bring out the prime meat. The figure walked out of frame for a moment, returning with a revolver. He flicked the shoe off the unconscious man's head and placed the barrel of the thirty-eight against it, firing without hesitation. A flash of red spray, and the man fell to the floor, twitching and soiling himself further. A halo of blood reached out from his cranium. Wayne's mind tried to process whatever ruse had just unfolded. The figure had looked bored as he left the frame now, dragging the bum and leaving a bloody trail. But he returned a moment later with a hog-tied young girl over his broad shoulder. She struggled to scream through a bandana gag as a figure dropped her to the floor with a sickening thud. Wayne gasped. Probably a runaway. She can't be more than 13 or 14. Reaper at UR6. Nice. Choke her for a while, but don't let her die. Not yet anyway. Winky face. The figure knelt beside the girl and Wayne slapped the laptop closed. He'd seen as much as he could stomach. It had definitely been a live broadcast, he acknowledged silently, taking a gulp from his wine glass. It had happened. But had it been real? Of course not. Probably just some film school FX students. 
Even fake, this new twist on old folklore was a compelling subject, and Wayne was confident he could now put cancel culture in his rearview mirror. Chapter 3. Methods Professor Philip Gordon stood in a herringbone tweed jacket before the lectern at the head of the lecture hall. A light from the podium threatened to reveal his 60-something features, but the fine lines were softened as the doctor of folklore was silhouetted by a giant projection screen atop the stage at his back. The blurry image of an alleged cryptid loomed above him, skunk ape. Some students stared at their phones while voice recorders did their note-taking for them, but most of the undergraduates scribbled notes more attentively. Wayne gently pushed open the door and slid inside, still wearing the slacks and wine-stained shirt from the day before, but opting to ditch the dress shoes in favor of the comfort his Jordans afforded. He stood beside the doors waiting for the lecture to conclude so he could request a moment with Dr. Gordon. And although these stories always sound quite plausible, they crumble to myth under even the slightest scrutiny. His accent screamed Yorkshire. Gordon leaned forward to allow the lighted lectern to illuminate his bespectacled face and stress his point. Urban folklore. Often, these tales are rooted, albeit distantly, in truth. The Candyman, for instance. A number of students stirred, clearly fans of the film franchise. No, TV babies, he wasn't a slave murdered for falling in love with a white woman. Gordon clicked his remote, and the image behind him dissolved into a grainy black-and-white service photo of a man in a military cap. Meet Dean Coral, the real candy man who murdered 28 boys from low-income housing projects in Houston in the early 70s. Coral's family had owned a candy factory, by the way. Hence, the moniker. Gordon clicked his remote again, and the image on the screen behind him dissolved to a black-and-white mugshot with a slate indicating the photo had been shot in Texas in 1975. Then again, in Houston, in 1974, Ronald O'Brien gamed in for me as yet another candy man. After lacing Halloween treats with cyanide and distributing them to several children, including his own. Ever since, superstitious parents insist on x-raying their children's Halloween candy for razor blades. Gordon raised his broad shoulders into a shrug and the students chuckled. He stepped from behind the podium. But there's never been a proven case of a stranger intentionally harming children by tampering with Halloween candy. You see, O'Brien's motive was apparently to collect life insurance payouts from his children's policies. He gave poison candy to their friends as a means to make the poisonings appear less targeted at his own children, thereby seeming more random. And though these real-life stories have candy and urban environments as elements, they have nothing to do with repeating names into mirrors or hooks for hands, I'm afraid. Gordon grinned, clicking the remote again, projecting a crude diagram of a safety coffin onto the screen. The invention had been designed for people buried alive erroneously in the days before embalming, and there had been a bell that could be rung by the way of a six-foot chain to the casket, just in case. Before Gordon could turn to the image, Wayne had stepped into the lighted aisle with a raised hand. Welcome, Mr. Vital. Gordon recognized him warmly. Dr. Gordon, what about snuff films? Wayne asked, finding the question appropriate given the lecture's apparent subject matter. More importantly, Wayne knew Dr. Gordon had a keen interest in that myth. Ah, you've read my dissertation, Gordon beamed, stepping from behind the podium. Same thing, however. The doctor seemed almost disappointed. Not a single law enforcement agency in the world has obtained any proof whatsoever to support the notion that anyone has ever been paid to murder another human being on camera for entertainment. In fact, a million-dollar reward for verifiable proof that even one snuff film actually exists has remained unclaimed for decades. Gordon returned to the podium, steadying himself against it. That's not to say there haven't been some compelling fakes. Most notably, in 1991, actor Charlie Sheen watched a Japanese movie so graphic in nature that he was convinced it was a real snuff film. He was so shaken, in fact, that he handed the VHS tape. <laughs> yes, VHS. He paused to allow snickering from the students. Over to the FBI in a panic. Well, agents quickly deduced that it was clearly staged as part of a horror film series. And nothing more. With the feds having a good laugh at his expense, Mr. Sheen was not winning that day, I assure you. Students laughed more audibly, but Gordon's outright dismissal caused Wayne unease. He cringed as cancel culture crept back into his head and his future. Once the lecture had ended, Wayne escorted Gordon to his office, where Gordon would undoubtedly partake in what he'd always called a low T before there could be any talk of academics. To an eccentric like Gordon, it had never occurred to him how unusual or awkward it was to sit in silence while Wayne waited for him to finish his snack from the other side of the professor's desk. No small talk. No talk whatsoever, in fact. But by then, Wayne had grown used to it and would typically text Christina until Gordon had finished his ginger biscuits and read his news. Today, 
Wayne just waited without looking at his phone, instead watching Gordon slurping his cuppa and staring impatiently at the man's bulldog jowls as he chewed. Gordon leaned back in his chair now, picking his teeth and continuing to pour over his newspaper. He filtered a belch through closed lips and adjusted his reading glasses. What about red rooms on the dark web? Wayne blurted out as if in the middle of a conversation. Gordon folded his newspaper slowly, setting it gently on the desk, removed his readers, leaning toward Wayne attentively. You know, like non-indexed hidden websites where you can literally get anything you want. Drugs, guns, contract hits, Wayne continued. Stuff like that. Gorn leaned back in his chair again, propping the readers back on his nose, and began unfolding the newspaper. That's not good. Yes, Wayne, but if I recall correctly, Silk Road was shut down in 2013. Gordon had resumed reading his newspaper. Wayne pressed. But there are other darknet sites out there just like it. Gordon curled a corner of his newspaper down and peered over his glasses at Wayne. Do I smell a thesis? Yeah. Wayne smiled crookedly. I think so. Gordon set the newspaper down and rose to stretch. And you'd like to explore this snuff film myth as it pertains to folklore in the internet age? Wayne recalled the bum's contorted jaw, the spitting of blood and teeth, the shot that rang out, the red mist, the lifeless thump, the twitching and pissing and shitting. He shuddered. Fact was, Wayne still wasn't sure what he'd seen. More or less, Wayne shrugged. Chapter 4. Results It had been enough to get the go-ahead from Gordon to continue researching the subject. At least for now. He'd have to document any future visits to the site, and he figured recording the laptop screen with a camcorder ought to do the trick. Wayne would have floated home on a cloud if not for the horrific images of the previous night. Can't unsee. Back to work. Wayne was in front of his computer again, this time entering his checking account and routing numbers into a Bitcoin exchange. Success. Wayne had just spent $598.37 on a single Bitcoin when he heard a text notification from the phone charging beside his laptop. Mark 1537. You're ready to play. The laptop's browser now routed itself back to giving up the ghost. You've been logged in as Wayne Vital. Oh, shit. Wayne fumbled to close the tab, clicking the X feverishly, but the scene of the empty chair remained in spite of his efforts. Wayne didn't feel mentally ready to be back here yet. The camera, he remembered, reaching behind him to press the record button. One Bitcoin has been removed from your wallet. A hooded captive was guided and bound to the on-screen chair by a figure donning familiar black coverings. The warehouse floor had been cleaned, or are they just broadcasting from somewhere else? The figure skillfully twirled a long, fixed blade hunting knife in his glove. Is that even the same guy? Wayne couldn't be sure. The deep, electronically modified voice spoke. We can see you, Wayne, and we can see the camera behind you. Shit, shit, shit. Wayne pressed his thumb over the laptop lens. Take your hand away, Wayne, the voice bellowed. We want to see you turning off that camera before we begin. Wayne kept his thumb on the lens. Now, Wayne, the voice insisted firmly, and Wayne relented, allowing them to witness the little red light of his camcorder turning off. Wayne took a seat in front of the computer. Whatever was going to happen had now begun, and Wayne was out nearly $600, so he felt obligated to write it out. The figure thanked Wayne for his compliance and placed its hand on the hooded man's shoulder, squeezing it. The figure removed the captive's hood, and there sat Dr. Gordon, hair disheveled. Mark 1537. Showtime. Oh, God, no. Wayne began striking keys. Wayne Vital. No, stop. We can hear you, Wayne, the modulated voice announced. You don't have to type all those big college words. The figure's gloved hand stroked the gray hair out of Gordon's bewildered face. Now, decide. Decide how to kill my advisor? How the fuck am I supposed to answer that? Or, the voice offered to Wayne's lack of response, I could choose for you. The figure's hand tipped Gordon's chin up, exposing his throat. How about a nice Colombian necktie? The figure pressed the blade against Gordon's neck. Just stop! Wayne shouted. How much to spare his life? The figure, perhaps intrigued by the question, approached the camera, entering keystrokes. A private chat window opened on Wayne's screen. Mark 1537. You're out of bitcoins, Wayne, but you've still got nearly 10,000 in your checking account. That will do. Wayne nodded to the camera. You better be good for this, Doc. Okay, just tell me how. Mark 1537. Tomorrow, you'll receive instructions, and don't even think of involving police, or he will die. The chat window in the Giving Up the Ghost tab closed simultaneously. Wayne sighed, catching his breath. 
He disabled his internet connection, then closed and unplugged the laptop, just in case. Chapter 5. Discussion Carrying a paper grocery bag stuffed with $9,797 in cash, Wayne stepped out of his car. The Volvo had been a high school graduation gift, but it still served him well. He and Clay put a lot of miles on this car back in the day. Wayne had remembered driving to the site. Now, Wayne found himself in some sort of industrial district at 5 p.m. Why couldn't I just wire them the money? All the buildings looked the same and none seemed to have addresses on them. Mark 1537 had texted him the address earlier in the day, and Wayne was certain he was at least on the right block. His phone chimed. Mark 1537, you're here. A steel door popped open several paces from where Wayne was stood, and he advanced toward it with a pounding heart. He stopped in the doorway, trying to let his eyes adjust to the darkness inside before proceeding. He slowly knelt to set the bag of money on the concrete floor just inside. The voice startled him. Come inside, Wayne. It was that awful electronic voice again, but it sounded much clearer now that it wasn't filtered through his tiny laptop speakers. To make the exchange, the voice insisted. Can't I just leave this here and you send him out this door? Wayne bargained. If I see anybody's face in there, I'm dead. That way, I'd never even have to see. Come inside and close the door, the voice interrupted. There are still terms to discuss. Wayne's eyes had adjusted somewhat, but the place was still pitch black. He stepped inside, looking back at his old Volvo as he pulled the door shut. Gordon yelped, Wayne! Sharply in pain nearby. Wayne picked up the paper bag, tucking it under his arm, and stepped into the darkness toward where he thought the scream had come from. Wayne couldn't see a thing, and he held out his hands to feel for walls and other objects as he shuffled forward. There was a metallic thump from a switch, and an overhead light came on over a card table in a far corner of the warehouse. You can leave the money on the table, the metallic voice announced, and we'll trust that it's all there. Wayne nodded, moving briskly now to the table where he emptied the cash from the grocery bag. So they know it's not my dirty underwear in the bag. Another thump of a switch and darkness descended once more. Another metallic thump and a light came on from a nearby hallway. Here, Gordon's voice echoed from down the hallway. I'm in here, Wayne. Take me home. Wayne approached and peered around the corner down the hallway. Wayne saw Gordon in the same dark coveralls they'd apparently dressed him in the night before, seated beyond the doorway at the far end of the hall, still hooded but no longer bound to the chair lighted from above. He rubbed his wrists as though he'd just been released from restraints. Beside him, a closed laptop rested on another card table. Wayne jogged past the doorway where the hallway opened up into a vast warehouse space. He knelt next to the chair, placing a hand on Gordon's shoulder. It's okay, I'm here, Wayne assured him. We're gonna go now. Gordon nodded and Wade untied the cord, cinching the hood around the professor's neck. Wayne lifted away the hood and beneath it he saw the featureless mask of Mark 1537 staring back at him. Wayne stumbled backward, falling on his ass as Gordon rose from the chair, peeling away the mask and unveiling the doctor's broad Yorkshire grin. Wayne's palm slapped at the concrete as he struggled to get to his feet. Gordon grabbed Wayne's shirt in his fist, pulling him from the floor and setting him in the illuminated chair. Wayne tried to stand, but Dr. Gordon raised an imposing index finger in his face. Remain seated, please, Gordon told him, placing the executioner's mask back over his own face. This ordeal is supposed to be over, Wayne's mind cursed, but he remained seated and dropped his shoulders defeated, tears welling in his eyes. He jumped momentarily at the sound of metal grinding across concrete as Gordon dragged the table into position, opening the laptop. Wayne sobbed, seeing himself on the screen now a part of what he knew would be another familiar, gruesome scene. Beyond the narrow ring of light surrounding him, Wayne could make out the sounds of others standing just inside the darkness. Whispers, shoes pivoting on the cement. Are they spectators? A muffled crunch. Is someone eating popcorn? The whine of a servo. A wheelchair? What did it matter? All it meant was that Wayne couldn't make a desperate dash to the Volvo while Gordon's back was to him. Gordon had friends here. Meantime, Gordon's figure hunched over the laptop, eyeing the chat participants. Next to the chat column, unbeknownst to the viewers, Gordon could see the two users with director privileges on his screen, betrayed by their own webcams. One of the directors, using the handle Hino, was an impeccably dressed Japanese man in his 50s. He loosened his tie with an impatient jerk but remained expressionless. The other, B. Tard, was a sweaty, overweight, 30-something neckbeard whose glasses kept sliding down his greasy nose. He pushed them up again and squinted at his screen, typing with clumsy, fat fingers. Be tard. Show me brains. The figure adjusted its headset and stepped out of the lighted area for a moment, 
regrettably returning with a metal meat tenderizing mallet clenched in his menacing fist. Fuck no. Wayne trembled and tensed as the figure stepped behind the chair he was seated in, raising the mallet ceremoniously. Wayne thought he might piss himself that very moment. He grasped for hope. Keep it together, man. You don't want to piss your pants and give people a free laugh when this all turns out to be an elaborate prank. But he knew there was no prank. And he knew he'd probably evacuate his bladder and bowels once he'd given up the ghost. He didn't want anyone to see him like that. Then it occurred to Wayne what a mess this disturbed folklorist was likely to make of him. Will there be an open casket? Would his body even be found? Wayne estimated there was probably machinery in this very warehouse that would turn him into dog food instantly. He longed to see the sun again, to see Christina again, to see his parents and brothers. He longed just to get in that old Volvo and drive home. Any minute, Wayne thought, none of it would matter. When you're dead, that's it. Still, he hoped that wouldn't be true. Showtime, the voice announced, and the figure swung the mallet with all of its might.